The three evangelical councils or councils of perfection in Christianity are chastity, poverty or perfect charity, and obedience. As Jesus of Nazareth stated in the canonical Gospels, they are councils for those who desire to become perfect. Telios cf. Matthew chapter 19 verse 21, see also Strong's G5046 and Imitatio Dei. The Catholic Church interprets this to mean that they are not binding upon all and hence not necessary conditions to attain eternal life heaven. Rather they are acts of supererogation that exceed the minimum stipulated in the commandments in the Bible. Catholics that have made a public profession to order their life by the evangelical councils, and confirmed this by a public religious vow before their competent church authority the act of religious commitment called profession, are recognized as members of the consecrated life. Consecrated life There are early forms of religious vows in the Christian monastic traditions. The Rule of St. Benedict ch. stipulates for its adherents what has come to be known as the Benedictine vow, which to this day is made by the candidates joining Benedictine communities, promising stability, conversion of manners and obedience. Religious vows in the form of the three evangelical councils of chastity, poverty, and obedience were first made in the 12th century by Francis of Assisi and his followers, the first of the mendicant orders. These vows are made now by the members of all Roman Catholic religious institutes founded subsequently cf. Code of Canon Law, Can. 573 and constitute the basis of their other regulations of their life and conduct. Members of religious institutes confirm their intention to observe the evangelical councils by making a public vow, that is, a vow that the superior of the religious institute accepts in the name of the Church. Outside the consecrated life Christians are free to make a private vow to observe one or more of the evangelical councils, but a private vow does not have the same binding and other effects in church law as a public vow and does not bestow the spiritual benefits that spiritual teachers such as Dom Columba Marmion cf. Christ the ideal of the monk, ch. v. attribute to the religious profession. A young man in the Gospel asked what he should do to obtain eternal life, and Jesus told him to keep the commandments. But when the young man pressed further, Christ told him, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast, and give to the poor. It is from this passage that the term, counsel of perfection, comes. Again in the Gospels, Jesus speaks of eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, and added, He that can receive it, let him receive it. Street. Paul presses home the duty incumbent on all Christians of keeping free from all sins of the flesh, and of fulfilling the obligations of the married state, if they have taken those obligations upon themselves, but also gives his counsel in favor of the unmarried state and of perfect chastity celibacy, on the ground that it is thus more possible to serve God with an undivided allegiance. Indeed, the danger in the early church, even in apostolic times, was not that the councils would be neglected or denied, but that they should be exalted into commands of universal obligation, forbidding to marry, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3, and imposing poverty as a duty on all. These counsels have been analyzed as a way to keep the world from distracting the soul, on the grounds that the principal good things of this world easily divide themselves into three classes. There are the riches which make life easy and pleasant, there are the pleasures of the flesh which appeal to the appetites, and, lastly, there are honors and positions of authority which delight the self-love of the individual. These three matters, in themselves often innocent and not forbidden to the devout Christian, may yet, even when no kind of sin is involved, hold back the soul from its true aim and vocation, and delay it from becoming entirely conformed to the will of God. It is, therefore, the object of the three counsels of perfection to free the soul from these hindrances. The love of riches is opposed by the counsel of poverty, the pleasures of the flesh even the lawful pleasures of holy matrimony are excluded by the counsel of chastity, while the desire for worldly power and honor is met by the counsel of holy obedience. Abstinence from unlawful indulgence in any of these directions is expected of all Christians as a matter of precept. The further voluntary abstinence from what is in itself lawful is the subject of the councils, and such abstinence is not in itself meritorious, but only becomes so when it is done for the sake of Christ, and in order to be more free to serve Him. The Catholic Encyclopedia article ends with the following summary. 
Criticisms of supererogatory interpretation of evangelical councils in a 1523 essay, Martin Luther criticized the Church for its doctrine that the evangelical councils were supererogatory, arguing that the two-tiered system was a sophistic corruption of the teaching of Christ, intended to accommodate the vices of the aristocracy. You are perturbed over Christ's injunction in Matthew chapter 5. Do not resist evil, but make friends with your accuser, and if any one should take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. The sophists in the universities have also been perplexed by these texts. In order not to make heathen of the princes, they taught that Christ did not demand these things but merely offered them as advice or counsel to those who would be perfect. So Christ had to become a liar and be in error in order that the princes might come off with honor, for they could not exalt the princes without degrading Christ—wretched blind sophists that they are. And their poisonous error has spread thus to the whole world until everyone regards these teachings of Christ not as precepts binding on all Christians alike but as mere counsels for the perfect. Dietrich Bonhoeffer argues that the interpretation of the evangelical counsels as supererogatory acquiesces in what he calls cheap grace, lowering the standard of Christian teaching. The difference between ourselves and the rich young man is that he was not allowed to solace his regrets by saying, never mind what Jesus says, I can still hold on to my riches, but in a spirit of inner detachment. Despite my inadequacy I can take comfort in the thought that God has forgiven me my sins and can have fellowship with Christ in faith, but no, he went away sorrowful. Because he would not obey, he could not believe. In this the young man was quite honest. He went away from Jesus and indeed this honesty had more promise than any apparent communion with Jesus based on disobedience. Topic. See also Topic. Pravita Mater Ecclesia Religious Vows Sermon on the Mount Jesus and the Rich Young Man Ministry of Jesus Essenes Supererogation Among the Cathars, the Perfecti also led an ascetic life of chastity and abstinence, but most of the followers followed easier rules of conduct. References This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Herbermann, Charles, ed., 1913. Article name needed. Catholic Encyclopedia. New York, Robert Appleton. Topic external links Topic Section on the Consecrated Life in the Code of Canon Law, 1983, including Canons 599-601 Concerning the Evangelical Councils Catholic Encyclopedia Evangelical Councils A Quaker Perspective on the Councils, the Powers and Community.